So, uh, good evening to all of you. This is our fourth uh, meeting, lecture number four out of five. Next week, we'll say goodbye. Um, we've been speaking about the birth of this early art from Zionism. And we spoke about uh, the 1950s and the clash between uh, modernism and localism. And we spoke last week about political art in Israel of the 1970s. Today, I shall speak about the return to the old Jew in the Israeli art of the mainly 80s and 90s, uh, practically or more accurately between about 75 to 2000. Well, what you're looking at is maybe the ultimate self-image of Israelis, of many Israelis in the 1940s and the 1950s. This is how Israelis, and not necessarily Israeli-born ones, but Israelis in general, like to see themselves not as a Sudani and a Nubian figure, which this culture represents, but as young, strong, elastic, muscled, okay, handsome, basically, okay. And you see the falcon, the shoulder of Mr. Nimrod. The name is Nimrod. Nimrod is described in the book of Genesis as hunter before the Lord. The hunter before the Lord. So he's a hunter. This is a hello. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Um, uh, so he's in direct connection with nature. Most of all, look at his penis. Is not circumcised, meaning he's not Jewish. So if I tell you, as I did, that this is the ultimate self-image of Israelis in, in, in the 1940s and 1950s, I mean that there was that movement known as the Canaanite movement, which was formed in 1939, the year that Itzhak Danziger, a prominent, very, very prominent, Sculpted in the Israeli art history, the same year that he did this one, 1939. The Canaanite movement was established, was formed by a poet named Yonatan Ratosh with the aim of future creation of a new Jew who is not Jewish but Hebrew. There was that distinction between Jewish and Hebrew. And by Hebrew, the idea was that we are, you will belong to the Middle East, we belong to the land, we are local, we are uh, in, in indigenous, okay? And culturally speaking, we grow or we stem from ancient Middle Eastern culture as, for example, the ancient Egypt or Babylon. This is why you have this falcon and the head, by the way, is influenced directly from the Easter Island uh, sculptures, okay, archaic sculpture. But the idea of a falcon and a head together comes directly from uh, Cairo Archaeological Museum, where you have Horus, the god Horus, the god of soul, okay, being portrayed exactly the head of the pharaoh with the falcon next to his head. And Yitzhak Danziger was not a member of the Canaanite movement, but he was very close to the movement. And in the history of Israeli art, many, including myself, would consider this work as a Canaanite in spirit, okay? Representing, symbolizing the idea of the Hebrews, okay, as belonging to the Middle East and not a Jew from the diaspora, God forbid. 
Not the two from the exile, God forbid. Because I remember very well that in 1915, one of the first issues of uh, Aleph, Aleph was the Canaanites journal, okay? There appeared an article claiming or arguing that the extinction, ex extermination of Jews in the Shoah is but a natural evolution, Darwinist evolution of the elimination of the weak ones. Jews in the, in the in diaspora in Europe are not what we want to be, the new Israelis. We want to be like Nimrod, okay? Strong, handsome, close to the earth, belonging to the Middle East, erotic, etc. This is one way of seeing the connection between Israeli art and Jewishness, which is our subject today. Another way, of course, is to say yes, and how can you not say yes to your heritage, to your history, to being Jewish, okay? Without all these fantasies about the new Jew, etc., cetera, a Hebrew one. So this is why I show you this disastrous sculpture, a terrible one, very ugly one, but very good as an example, called the New Acropolis, okay? Where you see these karyatids, the rabbis, three rabbis, karyatids, karyatids replacing or substituting uh, the, for the Acropolis temple of the, old, the old, uh, old temple of Athena. Okay, <coughs> we have six goddesses around. To go back to them, this work was done by uh, a, a Dr. Alfred Nosik, that was his name. He was a musician, an author, a sculptor, okay, a bad sculptor, but quite a famous one at, at, in his time, I mean, very beginning of 20th century. And most of all, an activist in the uh, Zionist circles, a, a provocative one, a, an opposition guy who collected many enemies within the Zionist uh, uh, movement, uh, and, and he 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 would be executed by Jewish uh, underground members in the Warsaw Ghetto, 1943, for collaborating with the Nazis, which for on his side meant he wanted to save the Jewish people by, by, by signing a deal with the authorities, with the Nazis, but that was not accepted. It was very badly accepted by the underground in war, so they killed him, okay? Uh, just to show how, 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 what a different man he was, how provocative he would be, et cetera. Uh, anyhow, the idea, when I show you this work, I wish to, to, to argue that uh, the Jewish way of, of, uh, uh, of the Jewish alternative, okay, of, of, of uh, art uh, in Israel and outside Israel, because it started, you remember, from the first lecture, the mid 19th century, when Jews left their Orthodox background to study with uh, Gentile schools, uh, art schools, and uh, leading artists uh, in, in Europe, Munich, Warsaw, Krakow, yeah? They created Jewish art, which dealt with the old Jew, with rabbis, with people in synagogues, etc., etc., Yom Kippur, etc., etc. But this alternative meant to uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to challenge the Greco-Christian history of art. There is Greco-Christian long history of beauty and arts, okay, with uh, masterpieces of, you know, Titian and uh, Caravaggio and Rembrandt and Michelangelo, etc. And now we come middle, middle of 19th century after 2000 years of thou shall not make images, etc., second commandment, no art in the European sense of the word, okay? And you want to create a Jewish response. How would Israeli art look 
as a Jewish response. Okay, now we start our, our lecture practically because here is Jewish art. This work was done in 1990, about 1990, 1992, by a young, at that time, young Israeli artist, a uh, graduate of Bezalel Art School named Arnon Ben David. If you remember something from my past lectures, I think the last one I, re I mentioned a, a, a young student who grabbed a, a, a gun and began shooting at a watercolors around the artist house in Tel Aviv. This, this is the guy, Arnon Ben David. Uh, who came here, by the way, made a doc his doctorate at Columbia in philosophy. He hardly makes art anymore, as far as I know. But you know, this, he, he, he was very successful, very appreciated artist around 1990 in Israel. And then he offered us this Jewish, Jewish art. What you have here is a, originally a three-dimensional object, kind of pseudo furniture, pseudo-functional, but abstract, pseudo-functional in the manner of, if you know, the works of Donald Judd, okay? Kind of minimalism, okay? Into which he stuck this Uzi submachine, which is an Israeli invention, okay? In a way, in a, a ironic way saying, the Uzi is the Jewish, the Jewish art of Israel. This is what we can, this is what we offer, yeah, as, as Jewish art. Of course, he was politically on, 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 on yeah. a very radical on his side, but uh, uh, we'll see more and more examples in this ex uh, lecture uh, where Israeli artists, young artists of the mainly 1990s, affirm, say yes to, to Jewish history, Jewish ceremonial objects, Jewish texts, knowing that they cannot get rid of it, that they cannot forget the Jewish past. At the same time, cannot, cannot agree with it, must revolt against it, must negate it. This is the story basically of our lecture today. For example, you see this environmental work, enormous, right? It, it was shown in uh, 2000, year 2000 at Herzliya Museum Tel Aviv. It's, it's in a huge hall, one, by the way, of five uh, parallel exhibition that Joshua Neustein, that we talked about him, he was here last exhibition, mm -hmm. uh, last, the last exhibition, last lecture. Yeah, uh, so uh, he made this one. And he repeated it in different versions in five different places around the world. My, one of them was in Salem, Ohio, here, by the way. Uh, what you see in front of you is a three-dimensional map of <coughs> Bnei Brak. Bnei Brak is a religious neighborhood very near Tel Aviv, very religious, very orthodox, okay? But as you can see, I mean, you can walk. All these are streets of Bnei Brak. It's a full map of Bnei Brak. Okay, you can walk in between the, along the streets of Bnei Brak, but what, what you're walking between is ashes. Tons of ashes that were brought, brought in here and were shaped in this structure. You also see the chandelier, the lower chandelier, the kind of synagogue chandelier that was lower is a sign of mourning, okay, because this is a dead town. This is a town that was on fire, allegedly. This is town of ashes. Okay. What did he want to express? Uh, the, so the immediate association, of course, is the Shoah, the Holocaust. But Neustadt would resist it strongly. And he would say, as he said, no, I'm talking about present, present in Israel, about, about the now about the religious parties, the way they, they, they yeah, the way, the, the, the way, the manner religion became a, a politics and thus lost its soul. So here again, Joshua Neustein is a graduate of yeshiva here in, in, in New York, came to Israel, if you remember in 64, okay? Yeah, and then back, 78, back to New York. Okay, so he, he, religion is close to his heart. 
it's always somewhere in his works. But at the same time, he says no, a big no. In, 19, in 2000, the end of 2002, December 2002, I organized an exhibition in Tel Aviv, a large one, which I titled, Thou Shalt Make, Thou Shalt Make, as a response to Thou Shalt Not Make, okay, images, etc. There I, I, I uh, showed some 70 or 80 artists contemporary artists that were dealing with Jewish themes in materials, in contents, okay? At the, at the entrance, at the whole idea of the, uh, of the exhibition was to cope with this question of how can we reconcile, or how does Israel in general and Israel art in particular compromise with the idea of being Jewish or doing a Jewish art? What is it to be Israeli versus being Jewish? Huh? Uh, at, at the entrance of the, uh, to the exhibition, there was this piece, about 30 meters, small one. It was drilled, it was drilled by Nona Orbach, okay? A young, at that time, <laughs> a young artist, okay, woman, uh, drilled into the wall, okay? And created this hole here in the shape of, if you want a vagina, Okay, covering it all together with the text of a mezuzah. She called it a mezuzah. This is a mezuzah. Okay, but generally the mezuzah, you know, hides the text inside. Okay, it's kept inside clo and closed. Now here she opened it up, like opening a body, like revealing a body, feminizing from the word feminine. Okay, feminizing. Okay, the, the, the mezuzah. Okay, or if you want the Jewish religion. Okay. At the same time, having the text overcome the body. Now think of it. Text overcome, words overcoming body. How do you say word in Hebrew? Milah. Brit milah. Brit milah. What's a brit milah? Circumcision. What do you do in circumcision? You cut the body. You cut part of the body. Okay? In order to affirm the word of God. Okay? So in that sense, that was a, a brave work. And uh, uh, very Jewish. So once we begin thinking of Jewish art, we must go back. There's no other alternative. We must go back to the beginning, to the revival of the Jewish art at the second half of the 19th century. You're seeing here a work by Polish Jewish artist, Leopold Pilichowski. By the way, he was, if you remember something from my lecture, he was a disciple of Hirschenberg, whom I mentioned several times, Shmuel Hirschenberg, he came to Betzalel, he died in 1908, he was very famous for, for his galut painting of Jews walking in a snow, you know, uh, so he was a student of Then afterwards, after he studied in Lodge with Hirschenberg, he went to study the art academies in Munich and in Warsaw, okay? He painted this work around beginning of the of 20th century, beginning. Some people say 1920s. I think it was a little before, okay? And this is called Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, okay? Now this whole... It, by the way, all, all Jews, okay, very religious, very orthodox. This is a very common, I said it in the first lecture, very common subject of the new Jewish art that revolted against, against, against the up, uh, orthodox upbringing, leaving orthodox background in the past and starting a new career, okay, a secular artist, but in their works, they went back to the old world that they left. Okay, so you see this synagogue scene, and as you know, the Shema Israel moment is during the blessing of the Kohanim, of the priests, when you are not allowed to look. You have to shut your eyes, okay? 
But look at Israel. There is a guy here who opened one eye. Okay. What I'm trying to say that one, it's true that they went back in their works to that orthodox world that they left behind. But something there in the work intentionally was spoiling the old. Something was not in order with the old, as if they affirm and negate at the same time. This we see, for example, also in another Filipovsky work called the Bet in the Bet Midrash. Okay. So you see these Jews, older and younger, studying probably the Torah or pro probably the Talmud. Okay, these are Talmud books, of course. And well, look at this guy, he's asleep. Okay. And this guy will fall asleep, soon will fall asleep. Okay. So again, we have kind of an irony, a little irony. Okay. Very little, very secret irony that tells us that. We are in an ambivalent atmosphere, an ambivalent approach to the idea of the Jewish, old Jewish way of life. Or take this Hirschenberg, this is Shmuel Hirschenberg from 1907. This is Spinoza, Baruch Spinoza, the great Dutch philosopher, Jewish philosopher of the 17th century, okay? This is, it's called Spinoza walking in the streets of Amsterdam. Okay, you remember he was boycotted, he was excommunicated, he was persecuted for his advanced progress ideas, yeah, about religion, about the Torah, his interpretation, about concept of God, pantheistic concept of God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We won't get into it. So you see him reading while everybody is terrified. Okay, the enemy is passing. It's interesting. This very moment, oh, I should move. I should move. I move too much. Sorry. I should not move anymore. No, people in the Zoom can't hear me when I move. Okay. Uh, this very morning, by, by accident, I got a mail from a Jerusalemite auction house. They sent me a catalog of the new auction where I found this etching from the 18th century of Spinoza yeah, uh, being attacked in Amsterdam. This attack on his life, this is Levin's whatever, I don't speak, uh, but Levin is life, okay? And I thought to myself, well, I'm going to talk about it to show Spinoza in the streets that he has sent me, this is from the 18th century, uh, by the way. Uh, and there was really an attack like that. It was attacked by by a knife, and he kept all his life, he kept the coat, the torn coat uh, of that event. Or I'm still in this idea of Jewish, beginning of Jewish art, 19, beginning of 20th century, end of 19th century. This is a work, sorry for the Alami thing, I took, you know, I took this picture from the, from the internet. Uh, uh, was done by a, an Austrian painter, named uh, Lazar Kreskin. Lazar Kreskin from Vienna. He came to teach in the Salad for, for one year. The same year that he created, uh, did this one, 1910. And it's called Forbidden Literature. All right? So you see the rabbi, the teacher, and look at the youngster. Are they reading Lady Chatterley's Lover? <laughs> Impossible, because that was written in 1928. <laughs> but you understand my the idea. There is something secular, okay? So again, you have this yes and no, or Maurice Minkowski, a Polish painter who was born deaf, by the way, and he found his death in Buenos Aires. He was in his 50s, early 50s. He didn't hear the car coming, and he was knocked down by the car. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so in 19, again, this was done in 1910, again, okay, it's called, uh, he glanced, he glanced and was heard. It's my translation, probably there's a, accepted, another more accepted uh, 
translation. But anyhow, it has to do with the Midrash, uh, the legend about the four young Jews that dared entering the so-called Pardes, orchard, but meaning the world of Kabbalah, the world of mysticism, okay, which is forbidden to certain age, and you have to study only from three o'clock in the morning in the morning and with a, somebody who knows about the Kabbalah. And they they're entering alone. Three of them came out unheard. The fourth got mad, became mad. This is Ben Zoma. Ben Zoma, famous uh, uh, scholar, Jewish scholar. Uh, of that, uh, 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 I think from uh, I think from 18th century. I'm not sure. Uh, anyhow, uh, well, here's the other. Here's the different one. Okay. Here's the unaccepted. A ca another kind of Spinoza. Why does Minkowski paint him if not to? Express some identification with him, some sympathy with him, to be other, to be in and out at the same the same time. Well, in a way, the question was allegedly was solved with the beginning of the first Zionist Congresses in 1897, with a new distinction of separation or division between the old Jew on the left side. And the new Jew, okay, the son, okay, who I mean leaves his father in the, the exile with the thorns around, okay, and he walks through the, towards the rising sun to Palestine, Eretz Israel, plowing the land, wearing a new kind of clothes, a new kind of hat, Jewish and non-Jewish, by the way, at the same time, the way he looks, okay. Uh, uh, this duality, new duality, uh was shown in many works at the beginning of 20th century Zionist works. For instance, in 1918, this portrait of a pioneer was done by Wilhelm Wachtel. He's a quite famous Jewish painter of the time, especially among the Zionist circles, showing this pioneer, look, look, look at him. Look at how Jewish and non-Jewish he is at the same time, okay? He wears a, a different kind of a hat. Like having hair, a different kind of beard, but having a beard. Okay. Well, he has a fork on his shoulder. Okay. He's walking the land. So, in that sense, he's not anymore the Luftgeschäften of, of, of the old Jew. Yeah. And he's wearing a Russian shirt, an open one, God forbid. And look at his new talit, something that resembles more a Mexican shawl. Okay. So, the yes and no, which We'll deal with during this. Or oh, take this work that was done. This uh, uh, a woodcut. It was done in 1935 by Josef Budko, another Jewish uh, Jewish artist from Poland who came to Jerusalem at that year or a few months before, and was staying for half a year in Kibbutz and Harod, and then moved to Jerusalem to be the first director of the new Bezalel. You remember the new the German Jewish. <laughs> Uh, a version of, of, of the salad from 35 on. So he did this one. Okay. You have the old Jew kind of disappearing into the okay, into the oblivion and the night and black, and versus the sun, the, the new Jew. Okay, again with a secular chair, a pioneer hat. Okay. So the two. He could paint the pioneer alone, as many did, but no, he made a point in combining the two. Okay, 1920, the association of Hebrew artists or Hebrew painters and sculptors was founded in Jerusalem. Okay, 1920. Well, look, you look at the symbol. The logo, the symbol of the of the of the association. Uh, the symbol was uh, designed by a Bezalel artist, uh, and as you can well see, I mean, this association this association was a framework of 
of, of a new phase, a new wave in Israeli art. I mean, this, this is where the new modernism will grow, okay, within and from the ex exhibitions of the, the Hebrew, the Association of Hebrew Artists and Sculptors. But look at the symbol. The symbol wants to say yes to the tablets of the law, to the blessing of the Kohanim, okay, of the priests, and in the middle, okay, something that combines brush of the painter on the one side and the tool of the sculptor to smear, you know, the plaster, etc. You use this kind of tool, okay? So this is art, but otherwise it's Jewish religion. The truth is that Israeli modernism more and more was reluctant with Judaism and more and more turned his back to Jewish themes a Jewish heritage. But from time to time, especially in the beginning, the early, uh, during the early 20s, yeah, uh, artists, modern, mo modernist artists in Israel would deal with uh, Jewish ways of life, orthodox Jewish ways of life. Like this watercolor that was done in 1925, by Pinchas Litvinovsky, who lived there in Jerusalem, arrived to Israel from Odessa uh, in 1919, and painted this, this couple, Jewish couple, young couple, in Sat, in Sfat, in the north of Israel. So you see, he is very small and she's very big, okay? But they are together and they would like to have a child, but not just a child, they want to have a son, a male child, okay? So, and as if to uh, 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 to teach the young couple how to, how to go about it, you see the he goat intercoursing the she goat down there in the co corner, okay? While at the background, you can read an Yiddish mystical text, kind of a mystical prayer that assures you of a son, okay? So, uh, 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 yeah, which Segula from Heiligen, uh, yeah. Heiligen is a, is a goat, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, when you look at this painting, you are right if you associate it with strong influence of Mark Chagall, okay? And I show this one Chagall, I won't show more. I will not show more Mark, Mark Chagall in this exhibition, in this, I can see, this lecture. This is famous work of his from 1914. Yeah, the uh, wandering Jew flying over Vitebs, Chagall's city. Uh, I show it in order to emphasize that Israeli art until the, 90, the late 80s hated Chagall. Hated, not personally, but Chagall's work, okay? Chagall's work was considered Israeli art, as, as you called here, with the name of the exhibition here in 1996, too Jewish, you know? It was too, too, too sentimental, too literary, okay? Uh, too much had to do with the uh, old Jews of the European states. We don't want to deal with it. We are Israelis. We are, we are a new country. We want to, we, to have a new identity, a new kind of art, that part of the world in general, you know, the whole world, the universal. So Chagall was a threat until the, why the end of the 80s? Because with the perestroika, yeah, the treasures of Chagall that were hidden in uh, the Russian museum, Petersburg were suddenly known to the world. And suddenly the real Chagall, the good Chagall, the important Chagall, the early Chagall, was discovered, unlike his more commercial and uh, famous one, the, the later Chagall. And, and Chagall, of course, was, rec I mean, everybody acknowledged his greatness, including in Israel. But this just, I'm emphasizing just to, 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 to add to my <clears throat> argument about this ambivalence and this difficulty of the Israeli artists to acknowledge Judaism or their Jewishness, either personally or in their art. 
take Ruben Rubin, the famous Ruben Rubin, by the way, who showed here an exhibition in 1922 in Fifth Avenue. Uh, he was from Romania, Chernobyl. So you see his work from 1919 or 1920 called the encounter or the meeting. Okay. At that time, Ruben Rubin considered himself, rightly so, as a religious artist. His paintings were about prophets and about bringing God's uh, messages, etc., etc. Here, you see the old Jew, the wandering Jew, resting on his eternal way of walking near a waning tree. On the same, uh, I mean, this is a bench. Bench. bench, bench, right? Same bench, sitting, sitting, Jesus, okay, with a flowering, you see, flourishing tree. So this is, you know, in the background, you see a, a mountain, a romantic symbol of spiritual ascent, okay. Ruben, Ruben, at that time. Combined, tried to combine Judaism and Christianity. When he came to Israel in 1923, he wrote, I'm here like Jesus to clean the temple, you know, from the sinners, to clean the art world from the, uh, the merchants, all right? But then, in 19, end of 1923, a few months after he arrived, beginning of 1924, he made this work, which belongs here to a private collection of some collector, maybe it sits here. You know, and it's called Friday evening. And you see this Oriental Orthodox woman, okay, with two halas, which he prepared for Shabbat, for Saturday, okay, symbolizing the two options, spiritual options that Ruben Ruben was hovering in between and couldn't decide at that time once he came to Israel as a religious, but now the Israeli reality, okay. Demand something else. So he asked himself, shall I be like this Arab at that time? At that time, in the 1920s, Arabs were considered as an ideal example of authentic localism of the natives, you know, and the pale Jew arriving from Europe, you know, wished to look like him or her, you know, close to the, uh, to the land, in direct connection with animals, his or her skin tanned like the color of the, the earth, okay? Sitting barefoot close to the earth, touching the earth. So this is one option, the oriental one, the native one, the authentic, the local, the <coughs> indigenous, versus the Hasidic one, the spiritual one, the religious one, the Hasid, but look at that, Hasid. His head in the sky, his back to the world, you know, he's detached. Shall I go on, asks Rubin, yeah, with this spiritual path that I've been going to, uh, through, or shall I shift to the local, oriental culture? We know his answer. The answer was that side. For example, this work from 1924, 25. Okay. Uh, Painting the Arab uh, villages, the Arab, the Arab themselves, etc. Et but what interests us in this uh, lecture is a work like this, for instance, a large work of his from 1950 called The First Seder, you know, the, 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 the Passover dinner, the first Seder in Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem is 1950, it's just been conquered by the uh, 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 Jordanian region, okay? You see uh, Jerusalem hidden there uh, in, in, in distance behind the walls. Reuben, Reuben sitting here with his son, David, okay? Uh, with his wife, uh, Esther, okay? Near him stand the newcomers from North Africa. You can see on the other side, a family of Yemenites, okay? Some Ashkenazi sitting there. And, a, and in, in, in front of him, the other side of the table, uh, 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 a biblical, a Bible prophet, okay? A, a prophet of the Bible. 
But what we are looking at, at mainly is in is the center of the paper, where he combines the rabbi, the old Jew, the Jewish heritage, okay, with the Israeli soldier of the War of Independence, okay. So you have the Israeli and the Jew together the same seder, okay, as an idea, is something to wish for, which he will try to do in his art, where from time to time he will paint Reba, uh, 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 Hasidic figures dancing in Simchat Torah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, another seder and uh, Passover dinner was done would would be painted in in the nineties. 1990s by Naftali Bezen, who arrived uh, to Israel in 1939. Uh, he was sent to Israel uh, thanks to his uh, talent as a painter, very young, and he was 17 years old, uh, 19 years old. Okay. Uh, yeah, 19 years old. Uh, now you have this possible dinner at the background, and you see that again. An Orthodox Jew, look at the dead fish on the right side, okay, symbolizing in Besem's work uh, the dead Jews of the Holocaust. Naftali Besem lost his parents in Auschwitz, okay, they sent him to Israel by himself, okay, they were left there in uh, Essen, Germany, and were taken to Auschwitz later on. And he's holding two candlesticks. One on the right side, you see the black halo, memory of the Shoah. The other one is a fallen one. It's the spin that he painted again and again, remembering his mother lighting the candles in uh, Friday, Friday, Friday evening. So Bezem would be a very obvious example of affirming the Jewish heritage in his or memory in his paintings. Like him, for instance, another one who was sent being 17 from his hometown, which was Warsaw, was Josel Bergner. Okay, his father, famous poet, Yiddish poet, Melech Ravich, okay, sent him, he was 17 years old, Josel, together with his sister to Melbourne, Australia, where he would soon become a leading artist of the new avant-garde of, of, of Australia. Until these days, when you go to a museum in Australia, Josel Berner is an important figure in the modernism of Australia. But this is work was done in 1940, shortly after the arrival, when Warsaw was on, on, on fire, okay? And the rest, you know what happened there in Poland. So now he's painting one in a series of works, but this is just one example of Jews leaving the shtetl, the burning shtetl. So this is another case of an Israeli artist who remembers being Jewish and affirm it in, uh, in his work. Another one, Shmuel Bach, who's been here in Boston for the last 40 years or so, okay? Or even more, okay? This was done in 68, while in Israel, depicting another wandering Jew, Okay, carrying a broken tree. The work is called uprooted. Okay, look at the at the, at the uh, um, crows on the top of the tree, the tree top, promising some death in this way or 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 or, or other. Okay, so another example, or of course. Mordecai Ardon, a work from 1988, short, not many, not a long time before he passed away. He created this work called the, Dig the Grave Digger, okay? In this series of work, he went back to Tuchol, his hometown in Poland, which he left in favor of art studies in Berlin, the Bauhaus. 1920s, but here he goes back to it in his old times, writing on the grave the name Mordecai ben Alexander, his name, Mordecai son of Alexander, okay, and then in Yiddish, there are all the heights, uh, the one who leads 
uh, fireplaces uh, her sich soon name a kapishke yash take a cup of wine or noch a kapishke kapishke another one lechaim lechaim okay kind of a Hasidic spirit of happiness all these painters that I just mentioned, four or five of them, that were attempting to represent Jewish memories in the world, were strongly rejected from the Israeli avant-garde. We're not shown in the leading muse uh, contemporary museums in Israel. Again, consider too Jewish, too literary, too sentimental, too anecdotal, too much all Jewish versus modernism, like this Moshe Kupferman from Kibbutz Lochamea Getaot in Galilee. You see, minimalism, serial work, stripes again and again very monochromatic, no story, no, con no, no obvious contest, okay? But here, here, here's the surprising thing. In 1975, there appeared here in New York in Art Forum magazine, uh, an essay that was accepted with enthusiasm and immediately translated to Hebrew, called Six Proposition About Jewish Art concerning Jewish art. It was written by Robert Pincus Wheaton, at that time, one of the leading or the fam more famous art, modern art theoretician in New York, yeah, who wrote more than once about Israeli modern art. And he was claiming first that abstract art is, is Jewish in its essence. Because of monotheism, God is not to be shown in or uh, represented in images. God is abstract, okay? Therefore, abstract art expresses the idea, the basic idea of Judaism, the basic conception of God. And in addition, mentioning Moshe Kupferman, this kind of work, 72, okay? As the number one Jewish artist in Israel, all right? So here you have another option, although we remember very well. I mean, I remember that the Israeli art scene was governed, totally governed by, by the abstract group, you know, you remember New Horizon, where you would hardly see a Jewish subject, a Jewish theme, a Jewish a, a Hebrew word, let alone synagogues and other things like that. God forbid, only forms lines, colors, composition, brushwork, etc. But as always, there are exceptions to the rule. Okay, so the one example, ex 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 exception in a New Horizon group is Israeli abstraction was an artist today very famous in Israel, Ari Aloch. He did this work in 1962. Okay. He called it Jewish motive. Jewish motive. All right. The bow structure is taken directly from an architectural facade of some synagogue. The, 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 the central image is a kind of a, a, a window, okay, but that resembles the tablets of the law, the convent. Okay, but at the same time, a breast, a woman's breast or tits. Okay, so what's the blasphemy? And again, more than that, you see the background, it's gold leaves, you know, gold leaves, like the Russian icons, okay, Christian icons that he knew very well from the time he was working in Moscow in the Israeli embassy, 1953 54. Okay, so Christianity and Judaism, a breast and a, you know, and the, and the tablets, the holy tablets, kind of blasphemy. Again, this paradox against 
the yes and the no that I keep saying, or take his work from 1966 called The Jewish Couple of the Dutchman Werkman. This is the title of the work. The Jewish Couple, I think it says it. Azuba Yehudi Shela Olandi Werkman. This is exactly the translation of what I just said. Well, Werkman was Nicholas Werkman, was a Protestant Dutch artist living and creating in Groningen, north of Holland. Okay. He, what can we do? He liked Jews. He liked Jews and he liked the Jewish story. In 1940, this Protestant guy created a series of 10 art prints on the subject of Hasidic stories after Martin Buber's stories, the Jewish philosopher. Okay. Uh, one of the prints was in this shape of a, a, couple, a Jewish couple dancing yeah, during Shabbat, Saturday. This is why the number seven is written here, the seventh day. Okay. So Ari Arov, this is work from 1966, rearranged this work when it's in homage to this guy that was executed by the Nazis in 45, three days, 45, three days before they left Koningen. They wouldn't forgive him for his liking of the Jews, this Mr. Welkman. Okay, so this is a march from one painter to another, but through the Jewish story, the complicated Jewish story. We are entering this early avant-garde. Someone will have to tell me the time, how much time I am left with, because I, don't, I won't be able to, to finish anything. Seven. Seven. Now it's seven. Tell me how many more minutes are left. Yeah, 30, 30 minutes. I won't finish the lecture today. But whatever I, I can say, I'll say. Uh, we're adding the avant garde scene of Israel, the real hardcore avant garde. This work is a large, large photograph, okay, and a large family photograph, and a large small one that Moshe Gershuni, very important name in Israeli contemporary art, passed few years ago, by the way, showed in 1971 in what I described last exhibition is the first conceptual art exhibition in Israel Museum, 1971, called Concept and Information. Well, as you can see, this is a family picture. Now read what's written up there. It says, I translate, my grand-grandfather, Moshe, son of someone, plots Poland, 1910, a point in space of and time. I chose that point due to my maximum possible approaches to it and from it. This is a direct, direct translation. Anyhow, this circle around, this emphasis, this marking of the grand grandfather wishes to say, I, I belong to him. I can't get rid of him. I can't say goodbye to him and turn my back to him. Impossible. 1975. 75 is an important year. It's shortly after the 73 war. 73 war was happening at the end of 73, went into the beginning of 74. You know, with the hard feelings of failure and disappointment with what happened and the losses, so many died in the war, the Yom Kippur War. So in a, as a result, or in the reaction to that feeling of despair, quite many Israelis yes, uh, it became orthodox, okay? Uh, and many others felt necessary to relate to the, that Jewish history, Jewish treasures, Jewish knowledge, Jewish knowledge, Jewish world that was ignored and rejected by Israeli art and Israeli society in many respects. Okay? So you see this guy, Michael Drooks, at that time he's already in London for the rest of his life, but he's now in Kassel, Germany. It was a, every four years there's a documentary exhibition, very important. And he's there at the entrance, the gates 
of his hotel or doors of the hotel. And you see, is he praying with phylacteries? Look at the phylactery. Here on his forehead is a camera box. <laughs> or on his left, on his uh, 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 arm, there is a camera. And the camera stripes are wrapped around the rest of his arm. And he's reading not a holy book, not a prayer book, not a Mishnah, not a Talmud, not a, not a Torah. Okay, there is probably some text that has to do with the works of art, with catalogs or something, or conceptual work. Okay. But it, the, the, the work is called Direction East, like prayers. He, he, he directs it towards East as if he prays. Why does he need to do this pose? Why he has to disguise himself as if he's putting on phylacteries, etc. Et I leave the question open, but it seems that the whole lecture is one big answer. I feel the need to, but I can't. I belong and I don't belong at the same time. I'm in art and there is my Jewishness. Can I combine the two of them? Combining the two of them begets a grotesque, a comedy. 1975, again, many works in this line, in this venue of this lecture were done, 75, 76, 77, these were the, the times. Jochebed Weinfeld has been in New York, living in New York for the last 40 years or so. At that time, a, a, a Tel Avivian artist, yeah. very famous in Israel, was showing a performance work at the Bell's Gallery in Enkarem, a neighboring in Jerusalem. The name of the performance is Nida, menstruation, woman's menstruation, yeah. the cleaning of the menstruation. Okay. In this performance, she sat with an assistant who helped her to clean herself in the most intimate parts of her body as according, very accurately, according to the Jewish laws of the Nida, okay? At that time, she was departing her husband who was religious, he still is religious, very famous in Israel, famous literature man, a religious one. And in this work, in a way, she was revolting against the limitations that the Jewish religion puts on forces on women. A graduate of Bezalel, 74, Moti Mizrahi, lifting his hand in, again, priest's blessing, himself looking like a prophet, okay, but wearing black gloves as if conducting some black, black ritual. Michal Naaman, or Naaman in Hebrew. I'm talking about important Israeli artists. This is from 1976. You read it, you read what you read. Yehovah Yudol Ares, God above everything. True, true, God is above everything, but when an Israeli, at least an Israeli, hears Yehovah Yudol Ares, he's shocked twice. First of all, due to the uttering of the explicit name of God, which is forbidden, okay? Then, due to the association with the German anthem, Deutschland, Deutschland, Yudol Ares, okay? Now Yehovah Yudol Ares, everybody remembers, makes the connection, historical connection, the rest of it, I don't have to get into detail. And now she lays this Jehovah on a kind of an altar as if sacrificing, sacrificing. At the same time, you see at the top, this collage of photographs, do you recognize it? It's taken directly from the cover of Ira Levine's Rosemary's Baby. You remember the film? Where they are sacrificing the, a baby to a state insect. Now, what do we say about it? What a blasphemy. But again, this unexplained need 
to relate to the Jehovah, to the Jewish God, to call with him, not to, 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 to affirm and not accept him in the same time. Like in this work of another one from 76, where she writes, Adonai Svaim. Well, this is explicit, explicit, again, again, explicit name of God, forbidden. Originally, for those of you who are not speaking Hebrew, originally it says Adonai Tzvaot. Tzvaot means armies, God of the armies. She changed Tzvaot into Tzvaim, armies into colors, God of colors, because she's an artist. Yeah, I don't want a God of army, I want God man. More if speaking men and women, yeah. Svaot, you know, in Hebrew, nouns have either feminine or masculine significance. Every noun has is, is either masculine or feminine. It exists in Hebrew and in other some some other language. So when you say Adonai, Svaot, the original Svaot is a negative is a feminine name. When you say Svaim is a masculine name. Okay, word. <clears throat> so what she does in her work in general, in this one in particular, is turning upside down dualities. The man becomes a woman, the woman becomes a man, the god of armies becomes the god of colors, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Tell me when it's five minutes to, to the end. Yeah. Please. Uh, another heavy, heavy, heavy name in contemporary Israeli art. That we just mentioned with a circle around the family photograph with the grandfather, Moshe Gershuni, you remember? Well, he had a dealer at that time, 86. <clears throat> the dealer went to, to, to Budapest. And in the Budapest synagogue, the dealer saw this drawing up there that was discovered behind the plaster of during renovations. He took a photo of it, the dealer, Shmuel Givon, the late Shmuel Givon, sent this to his artist, Moshe Gershuni, who made a series in 86, according to that strange, how to explain drawing, nobody knows what it meant, but it was enough for Gershuni to take this bow and the arrow, arrow and the bow, or if you want a helmet in a way, turn it being homosexual. This is one of the early homosexual works in Israeli art. Turning it into a bottom, okay? Excuse me for my uh, pornographic <laughs> text, but uh, this is part of this art, kind of abject art, okay? And this symbol of infinity for Gershuni meant a line leading to the anus, all right? At the same time, the colors in the background are of body liquids like, like urine and blood together. We're talking about death. The arrow is direct aimed against God, against sky. The hand of God, generally a protecting providence hand, okay, in medieval illumination, etc., turned a black one against the artist's hand, against God, very blasphemous. And the text that you read here is Hannah's prayer. Hannah was the mother of prophet Samuel. She wished for a child and it was a miracle like Jesus and Mary, okay, and she had a son, Samuel, and she sent God. And in her prayer, she says something like, the bows of warriors are broken, but those who who stumble are armed with strength, okay? And Gershoni writes it down. He had a thing with warriors, with, 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 with soldiers, especially with soldiers who died in the war, and especially with soldiers that he was attracted to sexually. This was a theme in his works from the early 80s, okay? So take it all together, and ask yourself, is this a Jewish, Jewish art? And again, why this need to, to argue with God? 
to fight with God. But the need is there. This is his work from 96, I think, 1996, about, okay? And you read down there the text, the prayer for the dead during funeral, God full with mercy, residing in sky, in the heavens, bring peace to the soul of, etc., etc. Okay? Death, funeral, mourning, in Moshe Gershuni's case, self mourning, okay? About eyes of God. But a black eye, empty eye, dead eyes. I know it because it, 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 it occurred in so many paintings of him during the 80s and 90s. The eyes of God, the eyes, the empty, the dead eyes. On the other side, 1980, an art event in Tel Chai, in northern Israel, okay, combining Israeli and international artists. There goes my good friend, the late Avram Ofek, with mirrors on which he writes negatively so that when he screens it on the wall, it become positively, okay? Like, yes, Elohim, there is God. Well, at that time, it's already five years after the war, six years. He came close to orthodoxy. He went to study in uh, Yeshiva, okay? And here he says, again, screaming from the, on the wall from a mirror, okay? And he said, here I am. This here I am that we know from the Bible. Here I stand before you, God, with full devotion, totally yours. Here I am. As Isaac said to Abraham, as Samuel said to God, and God called him during the night, okay? So this is an example, example where a non, I mean, he came from Bulgaria, secular family, okay, was a kibbutz member, Eina Mifratz, near Haifa, Shomer Atzair, you know, it's a total left wing Israeli, secular, nothing to do, don't tell me Judaism. But now suddenly, goes to the other side. Here is another Hineni. Unfortunately, all these people are good, good people are dead. Late Michael Michael Zgan Cohen died in 1990, in 2000, sorry. Mm -hmm. Ofek died in 1990. Hineni, here I am, total devotion. But second look, you ask yourself, why this appearance of a obituary sign with a black frame around? And what's this dot here? This disturbance, this out of order. This, I mean, otherwise it's so total, so clean, so direct, so one, uh, uh, one and only meaning. Hineni, here I am. But there was some accidental dot that came up. In, it's, it's a print, okay? It's a woodcut. Okay, and he could he could erase it, but he covered it with white. As he say, I don't want, I don't need this dot, but I don't want to get rid of it. He needed this interference, this disturbance. And when he, on the other side, again, this duality, this ambivalence, he wished to paint portrait of God, but he cannot as Jewish. Because you shall not have images, and God is abstract, you know. So what he did was he painted a mouth pronouncing a heavy in Hebrew, the name of God, okay, the forbidden name of God. He turned it into a painting in his way. All these fights went on and on and on. We are in 75. A young graduate of the college art school, Chaimaor, Kibbutznik, ties these tribes around the arms of his future wife, 
like Philip Perry's at the same time imprisoning them, saying religion imprisons and slaves. In 1990, he made this work called Twice, twice Philecteris, repeating twice this Bar Mitzvah boy and adding these bars of a crib, of a child, of a, of a baby bed that resemble prison bars. Again, religion and prison. As a yes and no. If you want to, if you think that religion is terrible, why do you paint it? Why do you create it? Why do you make a book of art? Why do you show us this bar mitzvah guy? Yes, I must. Ich bin an Araber, he writes. He prints on a parochet, on a on a on a curtain that one hangs on holy arch in synagogues. Okay. And in Yiddish. The language of the old Jew, okay, that for, was forbidden in Israel for scores of years. You couldn't have a, a, a theater uh, show in Yiddish in Israel for long years, okay. In, in, in around 1990, I'm an Arab, he says in Yiddish. <laughs> Why in Yiddish? Why in this? I mean, this paradox is absurd, yeah. If you can turn on a little, a little, we'll, we'll finish soon when time comes. <laughs> a newcomer, a young newcomer from Romania, Berusemian Fainaro, working, living in Haifa. A very talented young man. Not young, <laughs> they all were young. Yeah. Uh, around 2000, he builds a synagogue. This is a synagogue. Real cement, a big one, a large one. Okay, it can have maximum two people inside, but for him it's a synagogue. Okay. And but look at the windows of the synagogue. They are in shapes of letters, Hebrew letters. And the light comes through them. And this unity of light and letters is Kabbalistic in nature, in his nature. He invited people at the same time to make a tour with him in Jerusalem in the Bukharian neighborhood, which is known for his many, many synagogues. But the tour is in accordance with the letters Shin Mem Sham or Shem. You can read it as Sham, meaning yonder, there, the beyond, okay? The far beyond, which is metaphysical in a sense. But more specifically, you can read it Shem, which is the name of God, Bezat Hashem. In God's help, okay. He sued this talit, okay, with this these black forms inside in the middle. That if you combine them together, if you combine the middle, the four forms together, you get the black circle. Malevich, famous early abstract work from 1970, very influential work very mysterious work, very mystical work. But to go back to the Talit, it's dismembered. It's taken apart when it comes to art and, and Judaism. Yeah, Don't get along together that much, okay? Take this minimal work, it's like Barnett Newman, but it's a Talit. It was done by a, a, an artist named Ziva Netanel, okay? who tried to create Israeli minimal works based on Jewish ceremonial objects, or like this work of, according to the Yarmulka, okay? A kippah, a kippah and a minimal aspect <laughs> work at the same time. Speaking of Yarmulkas, you have this work from, nine, from 2005, <laughs> done by Eran Shakin, young one, a football. Fully made of Yamulkas. So uh, the line between ambivalence, doubt, fight, and blasphemy is very fluid. Sometimes you are here, sometimes you are there. Take this guy, for instance. He sits in, La in, 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 in Holland for the last, again, 40 years or so. Josef Zemach, very talented artist, Israeli. Or 
in his origin. Okay, he tears. This is from 78 into, into the 80s. He did it, tearing pages from Talmud, which in itself by itself is already blasphemy. Okay, <laughs> covering the middle text of the Mishnah and the uh, 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 interpretations of Rashi, Ibn Ezra, etc., that appear around. <laughs> yeah, painting it with forms of resemble uh, uh, what's the name? Uh, no, the Dutch famous abstract artist uh, Mondria. That's the age. Mondria. Okay. Or take is more complicated work. You see him here. In immediately, in a minute, you'll see, you understand why, why, why he did it. This was done in 2001, so at the Jewish Museum of Amsterdam. He sits on a drawing cupboard, you know, where you drawings in gallery, on a chair, his legs on a talit, folded talit, you see. He's holding a bronze cast of a rabbit. And see on the window, you'll see a cup of a glass of wine, red wine. Well, the red wine is a reminiscence or an echo of the blood of Jesus, you know, the Christian ceremony. So he he tries to respond to Christianity in a way. Also, I didn't mention this neon light, okay, down there next to him. Now it's symbolizing spirituality, okay. Well, he's here responding to a famous performance art work which was done, was shown in Düsseldorf, 1965 by the famous Joseph Beuys. Okay. The Joseph Beuys uh, was calling, called this work of his, this performance, how to teach a dead rabbit, how to teach art to a dead rabbit. Okay. Now he's holding a dead rabbit, a real dead rabbit, okay? You see his right leg, the right leg is tied with some wire. The back leg of the seat of the chair is wrapped with felt. Remember the materials, the other boys, the felt blocks energies, the wires like fat, you know, transfers energies, he tried to control energies. Yeah, his face covered with gold leaves. Okay, very pagan in spirit. This mystical work, which everybody, so many try to interpret and it's never ending. So I go back to our friend. Uh, his rabbit is of bronze. He knows or he remembers or wishes to remind us two things. One is that the Nazis were talking about hunting rabbits referring to hunting Jews. So for him, a rabbit or a dead rabbit is a dead Jew. At the same time, he wants to remind us that Josef Boys was a Luftwaffe pilot, okay? Uh, who was knocked down, by the way, by the Allies in the early 40s, okay? Uh, so, uh, and he wants to answer a Jewish answer the Jewish light answer, okay? The Jewish talit answer to both Christianity and Joseph Boyce. So an, another attempt to be Jewish, although he's very secular. The end of God, the end of God. This is what's written in uh, Neon Lights by David Ginton who was raised in an Orthodox family. He was sent to an Orthodox school, but quit Orthodoxy during his army service. And now he writes in the manner of Bruce Nauman, Bruce Nauman, American artist, contemporary, who was, he, he did many works in neon, neon text in neon, or lines in neon, neon lights. Yeah. And he writes this paradoxical sentence of the end of God, how can, I mean, how the, can the endless, the infinite, 
How can they even be in heaven? And then, so again, this paradox, that is the undercurrent issue of our lecture today. Oh, take this painting from 2003, finish it in 2003, called Portrait of God after Julian Schnabel. Well, what you see is you're not a Beckhoff painting. You see a painting of a Beckhoff painting. This is a realist representation of a Beckhoff painting, one of a long series of Beckhoff paintings that he did. Now he says, this is what you see, you know, on the back of paintings, you write the name of the work, the year, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't see the work, we don't see the portrait of God. We are not allowed to see as Jews the portrait of God. Moses saw God. But according to the Bible, if one sees God, one is doomed to death. Okay? So it's after the portrait of God, the painter was painted by Julian Schnabel. You want to see God? You want to see God? Here is God. This is Julian Schnabel's portrait of God. Okay. But David Ginton, David Ginton wouldn't allow us even to see a reproduction of that. Okay. Five minutes. So I'll skip a few look at that. The PLO, the name of God. Like two commercial, two logos, marketing logos, having the same. This is the same Arnon David, Arnon Ben David, that I showed at the beginning with the Jewish art and submachine, the Uzi submachine. Okay, again, uh, early 90s. Um, okay, young newcomer from Russia, Sloya Cherkesky, the year 2003, she needed this pillow with a parody on anti-Semitism, okay? The image of the Jewish wanderer as depicted by anti-Semites for hundreds of years, you know? Or making, she was making this puppet of, Jew, of a Jew in the anti-Semitic manner. Not that she was, because she's anti-Semite, she's paradising. This is the irony. Oh, these two candlesticks that called Romeo and Juliet, mm -hmm. representing Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. Mm -hmm. right. Made in 2000 by a young woman named Adarma or Dagami. Ah, you see all these books. These are taken from the Gemiza. You know what Gemiza is? It's when you bury the damaged holy books. If a holy book, the Jewish holy book is damaged, you have to bury it, okay? Uh, like a human burial, okay? They, it's called Gniza. Uh, Jacques, Jacques Jano, who was a student of mine, the salon, yeah, takes the book out of the Gniza and creating, you see what he created from the books for, for the papers of the Gniza, he created structures of a righteous uh, tomb. He comes from a family from North Africa and they worship the, those. Or he did this work around 2000 or 1995, uh, which is called Lech Lecha, you know, uh, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, etc. God saying to Abraham, carrying the, 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 book, the dead books in a nomadic. Like it again, like a wandering Jew, an American newcomer, Andy, Andy Aronovitz, yeah, living in Jerusalem. It's called Rachel's Vest, you know, it's 2005. The Hamagolam who chokes himself with a nylon bag with text printed on the nylon, the book of women according to the Jewish law, where women are treated the way they are treated, like, for example, this high heel, high heel uh, shoe, which he made of papers of Giza book, 
saying Haisha, the woman, and we read from the Talmud. There are three ways a woman is being bought, either with money or with money notes or with an intercourse. This is the text. Okay. And of course, she's protesting. Or speaking of protesting, we are almost ending. You have Ruth Kastenbaum, angry face. It's her face. Why is she so angry? She looks at a Talmud, book of adultery, Abu Dazara, about representation, the forbidden representation and the allowed representation. And she emphasizes the line down there, you see, the blackened one. It says, all the faces are uh, allowed, excluding a face of human. And she put face a face in protest, which brings us to the final word of this lecture. And to Again, the question that we've been following during all the last one hour and a half. How can Israel live in peace with Judaism? The secular Israel. Can it ignore the Judaism? Can it say no to its Jewish identity? How can Israeli art live with it? Jewish heritage? How can it come to terms, compromise with Jewish art the way it was born in the 19th century, beginning of 20th century? Well, in the year 1988, our friend Aram Ofek, the one who was screening the mirrors around Yesh Elohim, there's God, created his final if you want, will. He was severely ill, he had cancer. He knew that his time is, he was in a terminal state of his cancer. He would die in January, 1990. And he was asked to paint a huge, very long, 36 meters long uh, wall painting at the entrance of Haifa University where he was a professor. And he painted himself sitting on the left side in front of a painting of his, listening to a lecture given by Professor Abraham Kampf, who was the head of our man, our, our chief curator at the Jewish Museum, the late 60s. And now he's the head of the art department at Haifa University. I mean, at the time of 88, he died in it. So Professor Kahn is giving a lecture on Israeli art. This is a, a vision of the future. This is a utopian vision, a dream, a fantasy. How will or how should Israeli art, what's the right path for Israeli art to follow, according to Avram Ophir? So next to him, near him, are his family and friends. We know each of the faces. We, we recognize them. On the, at the far end of the table is three children, the two boys and the girl. The girl in the middle, the time he painted it, already committed suicide. He was dead. But look at the rest of the painting. Behind the lecturer, Professor Kahn, there is the praying Jew of Mark Shagar. The neglect, the, the Shagar, the rejected Shagar, the unaccepted Shagar in Israeli modern art. And on the table, on the right side, our friend from the beginning, Nimrod. The Hebrew one, the non Jewish one, the uncircumcised one, the uh, Middle Eastern one, the local one, the Hebrew and non Jewish. And that's the vision. That's the future according to Avram Ofek. Combination of the two poles, uniting the two enemies into one synthesis of Israeli art, which is a Jewish art and Jewish art is Israeli. And by this, I end my lecture. Thank you very much.